Okay, we'll get going. Today we begin the last of the major topics in this first half of the course before the midterm. The theme is perception generally, and in keeping with most work done in the field, we will be focusing particularly on vision. Humans are extraordinarily visual animals. Vision plays a major, major role in our sense-making activities in the world. Um, other animals have the balance between sensory modalities somewhat differently. But focusing on vision is somewhat misleading as well. Um, vision, for one thing, creates this sense of a world out there beyond the body distant, because I can see things that are even quite far away. In many respects, I suppose, touch would be a more canonical or representative sensory modality, if that means anything. When we touch things, we have to explore them with our hands. If I give you a sponge and I say, is that hard or soft? You have to squeeze it uh -uh, in order to find out. Now, in seeing, we are, as it were, squeezing the world with our eyeballs. That is, we are using our eyes to selectively pick out different pieces of information to orient ourselves with respect to the world. Um, but that connection between our activity and the experience of seeing is less direct. It's, le it's less obvious to us. Heinz von Furster, who we met in an earlier part of this course telling a joke about Pavlov, he used to quip that we see with our legs. Because as you walk around, so the pattern of light and dark on your retina changes, and therefore what you see changes. So vision is a whole body activity, is his point. It's not just eyes. So before we kick off and we get to look at vision, I want to say some very general notes about sensory perception. What do we mean by a sense? We mean the point at which the nervous system interfaces with the world somehow, on the basis of which we come to know the world. So we're told in school that you have five senses. What were they? Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching, right? And that these senses are like channels that transmit information about the world to the mind. And we're going to work very hard to say that's a terrible, terrible, lousy picture. It's wrong. Um, we're going to focus on two ways in which it's wrong. This is, we have modest ambitions in this course. The first has to do with that number five, which we can immediately, and without any generating any controversy, we can clearly show that five is not the right number. There is no right number, but if there were, it wouldn't be five. <laughs> the second reason that this statement is so misleading is because it suggests that the senses are like open channels through which the world comes bleeding into the mind. And it's a more subtle point, but it's also wrong. We'll get to that. Let's take the simple one first. Five senses, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling. Well, when we look at the sensory receptors, there's audition. In the ear, we are, <coughs> have sensory receptors where patterns of vibration in the air are turned into nervous system energy. It's a wonderful sensory modality. No one's going to quibble with that. Vision. We have patterns of light and dark on the retina that cause nervous system activity um, transmitted up the optic nerve to the brain. No one's going to quibble with that. So there's two very important sensory modalities. Touch, we'll see, unpacks into a whole bunch of different kinds of sensory information. So we sense hot and cold as well as skin stretching, as well as vibration. We also register pain there. Um, we'll unpack that in a minute, but touch will explode into not one, but I'm not sure, four or five different kinds of sensory information. So there goes the number five right there. What about the last two, taste and smelling or olfaction? Well, they're not independent of one another. You all know that when you have a really, really bad cold, you can't taste anything either. Your taste buds, you've got only about four or five different kinds of taste bud. Um, sensing through smell and sensing through taste are so intimately linked that this is not really two separate kinds of information. So we got the number five goes up when we consider touch, and it goes down when we consider taste and olfaction. But we've even left out some. 
some very important sensory modalities. Deep in the inner ear, we have not only the, sense, the, the origin of the sense of hearing, we also have a series of little canals, the semicircular canals, that provide information about acceleration and balance. And they work together with the visual system, providing us with very important information. The vestibular system is a sensory modality that got left out. Then we have, in all our muscles and joints, we have receptors that provide information about this, <coughs> the position of the body, the position of the limbs with respect to the body, and more importantly, perhaps, the sense of movement. Information about the state of the joints and the limbs is proprioception, and kinesthesia is the sense of movement, the trajectory of movement of your body, of which you're very aware. Otherwise, you'd be bumping into things all the time. They got left out. They're also not very well understood, these modalities. And finally, we've got this grab bag of sensory information about the state of the innards of your body. Um, you sense hunger. You, you become nauseous when your digestive system um, encounters chemicals of a certain kind. You're aware of the condition of your guts. Hopefully not too aware. Um, but you are aware of, made aware of the interior of your body in very many very poorly understood ways. So let's look at some of these cases that don't fit that nice pattern of five senses. Touch, we said, is more than one, one thing. Now, when I say it's more than one thing, I mean when we look at this, the neurophysiology of the skin, we find receptors, that is, points at which the nervous system kicks in, but we find more than one kind of receptor there. We find receptors sensitive to different kinds of information. So you're all aware that you have thermoreceptors in your skin. If there's a hot plate on, you don't have to actually touch it with your hand. You can bring your hand close to it, and you will feel the heat. So that's one kind of sensing that's independent of the kind that happens when you touch something. There are receptors in your skin that fire like Billy Who when you cut yourself, or burn yourself, or otherwise damage the tissue. This is a form of sensory awareness that's very non-specific. It's not very good at telling you what's doing the damage, but it's very good at telling you you should get your hand out of there. That's nociception. Should we call that perception? I'm not sure. It's certainly one of the means by which we make sense of the world. Um, but they're also located in the skin, among other places. Then we've got receptors which are sensitive to skin stretching, slight stretching of the skin. And they're a very important source of information as we gently explore something with our hand. We've got receptors which are selectively sensitive to vibration, to buzzing, as those of you who carry mobile phones will know, but they've been around long before mobile phones. And we've got receptors quite deep in the skin that are sensitive to focal pressure. So if you push down hard, you're deforming tissue quite deep. And those are separate from the ones that are sensitive to skin stretch. So touch really unpacks into quite a few different kinds of information. It's a really important, interesting, and complex one that makes us think, hang on, maybe this idea of counting sensory modalities is not such a good one after all. The vestibular system in the ear. These semicircular canals are filled with fluid, and they've got little hairs, and the fluid causes the hairs to move as your head accelerates. So when you turn your head or you jolt it forwards, these are providing very important information. If you stand on your head, you don't actually get the impression that the world is turned upside down. You're very well aware that you're upside down and not the world. There's nothing going on in the eyes that could tell you that. That's vestibular information coming here from the inner ear. And that's kind of weird, isn't it? Because it means that this is part of your sense of seeing. So seeing is more than what's going on with the eyes. You see this even more clearly if any of you have had the following experience. You're sitting in a train in a station, waiting for the train to move. You look out the window and there's a train at the other platform as well. And now your train starts to move very, very slowly and it picks up steam. And then suddenly with a jolt you realize it wasn't your train moving at all, it was the other train. How many of you have had that experience? Quite a lot of you. And it doesn't happen in buses, and it doesn't happen in cars, and it doesn't happen in bikes, but it happens in trains. Why? Parallel movement. Parallel movement. Doesn't have to do with being parallel, no. 
the tra two trains are parallel to each other, but we're asking what's going on in the eyes. Well, there's nothing in your eyes that can actually tell you whether you're moving or the other train is moving. The visual information is exactly the same. Trains are very heavy. It has to do with the weight of the train, which means that they, when they start moving, they start moving very slowly. They don't accelerate greatly. When a bus starts moving, you're all familiar with the jolt. And a car and a bicycle, you get jolted around, there's a lot of acceleration and jerk going on. But a train moves so gradually that all you've got then is visual information, you have no vestibular information. So the vestibular system is not capable of doing its job in a train in the same way that it is in a bus or uh, on a bike, because the train is heavy. Proprioception and kinesthesia are poorly understood. There's a variety of kinds of receptors that provide information about the state of the joints and the muscles, the position of the parts of the body relative to each other, and your awareness of movement through space. Dancers have a very fine kinesthetic sense, but we all have a sense of movement. It's a very, very important sense. And if you have some kind of brain damage that removes proprioception, for example, this has happened, then you constantly have to look at your body to find out where the bits of the body are, and you're liable to hurt yourself in ways that an intact nervous system would never tolerate. Then there's this weird business of interoception. If you're nauseous or you're hungry, it's because there is some kind of sensory information from about the state of your body, the homeostatic state of your body, about your digestive system, your respiratory system, your hormonal system, informing you that you need to take some kind of action. Interoception is probably the least studied and least understood of all these various modalities. So, the number five just went out the window very quick there, and there's not a sensory physiologist in the world that would disagree. This is not contentious territory. We simply simplify and tell a very simple story to kids. The second point I made about the view of perception as being based on the input of sensory information about the world here, the reason we want to take issue with this is more subtle, but it's in many respects more important. We come to know the world by actively exploring, by seeking and generating sensory information through guided action. This is most clearly obvious if you wear a blindfold and I give you something and you have to explore it with your hands to find out what it is that you're confronted with. But it's just as true of the visual system even the auditory system, the, that least directional of system, but we won't be talking much about audition, unfortunately, in what comes. We will be exploring this purposive nature of perception, though, in some detail. And now, with those general notes about perception as a preamble, we're going to start with vision, and it's precisely at this second point, the purposiveness, that we're going to start. We're going to try to understand that vision is for something. Now, we are humans. Humans have a very complex evolutionary history with a big history of innovation. So our visual systems are enormously complicated. There's lots of different parts in there that are sensitive to lots of different aspects of the world. And we'll see some of that differentiation in a minute. When we were discussing movement, we noted that the phylogenetically, the earliest nervous system seemed to evolve precisely to deal with the complexity of moving around in the world. Well, we could say the same about visual systems. And why do we move around? Because we want to identify food, we want to reproduce, find mates, we want to avoid predators, and we want to find somewhere to rest. So vision is, serves all these purposes. It's part of the movement system in simple animals. And what we're going to do then is we're going to go look not at the human visual system. First of all, we're going to go back down the evolutionary chain. We're going to look for the simplest visual system that we can find. And we find that in the larva of a box jellyfish. This is the larva. The kind, there are several species of box jellyfish. They all pack a very nasty sting when they're in their adult form. The larvae are much more simple than the grown-up jellyfish. The grown-up jellyfish have rudimentary nervous systems, but the larvae don't. This particular species, Tripodalea cystophora, lives in the Caribbean in relatively shallow water. And it has only five differentiated cell types, two of which are found in the membrane, 
or the outer layer that separates it from the world, and the remaining three are found inside. And it's with that membrane that we are concerned, with the cells here that form the boundary between the larva and the water. In here we find two different types of cells. We find cells, most of the cells here, have, each cell has an individual hair sticking out. And those hairs wibble, wiggle randomly. So you've got a whole bunch of hairs jiggling randomly, so the direction that this thing moves is going to be random. That's not a very good solution, but it's only part of what's going on. Nestled in among these hair cells are these light-sensitive cells, the ocelli. They also have hair sticking out, but they are quite different. They respond to the gradient or the angle of the incoming light. Now, light comes from a source. It could be coming from there or it could be coming from here. And depending on the angle of the incoming light, this is one of those cells here, you can see that there are changes, chemical changes in these little photoreceptive vesicles, which cause these hairs to move, which cause this long hair to adopt a fixed angle with respect to the angle of the incoming light, a fixed angle with respect to the gradient of the light. Let's think about what that does and why it does it. First of all, what it does is very, very clear. If you have random motion, but you also have some elements which are at a fixed angle in the water, you've made a rudder. This is what a rudder is on a yacht. The thing at the back, that you, it's a plank, you stick in the water and you hold it at a fixed angle with respect to the passage of the boat, and it steers the boat. So these are steering the larva based on the angle of the incoming light. Why is that sensible? Well, these guys live in shallow water, light is up, dark is down, and they feed, they live off algae, which grows up, it grows in the warm areas that are closest to the light. So by moving towards the light, it's steering towards the food. Now we know everything there is to know about this visual system. First of all, there's no separation of perception and action. This small little animal with its two cell types is exploiting information that's available in the ambient light in order to move, in order to get its food. So that's the purpose of nature. There's no sense that this animal is seeing in any respect that's comparable to your human seeing. It's, you're not going to go to the cinema with this thing and watch the new Star Wars movie. It's capable of exploiting exactly one aspect of the incoming light, of the ambient light, and that's the angle at which it meets that light. And that provides the information it needs to steer in order to get its food. It's a remarkable thing that we can understand an entire visual system. It's hard to, to fathom what a simpler visual system could be. Many of you won't be happy calling this a visual system because you say, well, it's not seeing like I'm seeing. But what I want to tell you is that your sense of seeing is much more complex, is based on a lot of different kinds of information, it's many different things, and it unpacks. And yes, your ear is playing a role in your seeing as well. These guys also don't have ears. Now, the light that this uh, creature is responding to is found in its environment, um, and it comes from the sun. And we are bathed in light. We're bathed for far more in electromagnetic radiation. This is a plot of the electromagnetic spectrum from gamma rays down here on the left all the way up to AM radio here on the right. And there's only a small part of this electromagnetic spectrum which our eyes are sensitive to. We call that part visible light. Some animals are sensitive to lower frequencies and some to higher frequencies than us. So a little bit into the ultraviolet and a little bit into the infrared, but not much. So that basically all terrestrial vision is based on this little bit of the electromagnetic spectrum. Why is that? Well, it has to do with the nature of the star that we happen to live beside. If we lived beside a different star, we'd have different kinds of eyes. We can see this quite clearly when we plot here two things against each other. This outer curve shows the intensity, that's the y-axis, the intensity of the incoming light from the sun at different frequencies, and the white area here is the range of frequencies that we call visible light. Down here in the brown we've got ultraviolet, up here in the orange we've got infrared, and that goes on 
very far in both directions, but you can see that the light coming from the sun is particularly intense, specifically from here to here. And down here we've plotted the sensitivity of the human eye to these frequencies. We're not sensitive at all to ultraviolet or infrared. We're sensitive precisely to the range of light at which the radiation from the sun is most intense. If we lived beside a different kind of star, then we'd have different kinds of eyes with different sensitivity ranges. So we can understand this sensitivity very clearly by looking at the environment in which these evolved. Vision evolved for something. Okay, there's an eye. This is a human eye, and in many respects people alike like to compare this to a camera. But an eye is a part of the visual system, and the visual system includes your whole body and your whole brain. Sorry, I shouldn't even say, make that distinction. It includes your whole body, including your legs and your brain. The eye doesn't work on its own. It doesn't see anything on its own. And as we'll discover, seeing is not a matter of the registration of images. There's a lot of confusion here. So we'd be particularly concerned with cases in which the vision of the eye as a camera diverges from the eye as an element in a functioning visual system. The camera-like elements are the pupil here, which is an aperture, which is, can be adjusted to suit the light. We've got a lens here, which focuses light on... Now, here's a big difference to a camera. It doesn't just focus the light to create an image. It focuses the light particularly on one very small region here called the fovea. And the rest gets less distinct um, focusing. You don't have clear, you don't have anything like a clear image projected onto the back of the retina as a whole. The clarity is just in one small area here called the fovea. And it's in the retina that we have the sensory receptors that transform the pattern of light and dark, the changing in the pattern of light and dark, into nervous system activity, which is projected to the brain. Those receptors are of two different kinds, and they're not evenly distributed around the retina. Around the fovea here, just in the fovea, we have complex things called cones. They come in three varieties, and collectively these three are responsible for our color vision. And they're densely packed right around here. And we get a very different kind of receptor out here in the periphery. There we get something called a rod, which is sensitive to... Uh, light and dark, but not to color, and is sensitive to movement. The cone in the fovea require a decent illumination. The rods in the periphery are very sensitive even in very low, low light lighting conditions. And here we can see the cone, here's a distribution of cones and rods in a cross section across the retina. You can see there's a peak here. The cones are really only found in this one area. Um, with the rods, that's the blue ones, are found throughout the periphery, except for this one area, one part of the retina, where the optic nerve leaves. So if you don't think of the retina as a as source of an image, it doesn't work like that. For, and if that were the case, it would have to be still. And we'll see it's never still. It would have to have a uniform kind of receptor with a focus all over the whole thing and we'd have this problem of a big hole in the middle. But we don't have that problem, and the retina is not receiving an image. Things are a bit more complex than that, and that's no surprise. As we move from the eye, we're going to look next at how the eye is plumbed into the brain. And whoever did the plumbing, don't get them to do your bathroom, because it's really weird. <clears throat> the eyes, of course, are at the front of your head, but the plumbing goes into the very back of the brain. Go figure. We can have a look at it here. Here's the eyes at the front. There's the optic nerve leaving. And there we've got about this far in, about three or four inches in, we've got a point at which the two optic nerves meet and some fibers cross over to the other side and some don't. That's kind of weird. Then there's one more way station here, the lateral geniculate nucleus. Some fibers go off to a structure called the thalamus that we're going to ignore for now. And the rest go into the very, very back of the brain, in the occipital lobe. That's bizarre plumbing. The ears are similarly weirdly plumbed in. You'd think that it would be 
a very short distance from the inner ear to the brain. They're almost beside each other, but in fact the projections are all over the place and most of what you hear coming in this side, you're hearing from this side of the brain. Why? I have no idea. That's the way evolution works. But it has the following property. Here's a slice through a head again. These are the eyes looking forward at this spoon. The spoon is out there in the world. And as you look forward, you have everything you see we can call the visual field. And the visual objects in the visual field project onto the back of both eyes here. And you can see in this diagram, the projections from the right half of the visual field are colored red. And projections from the left half are colored blue. And both eyes, of course, receive projections from the whole visual field. But after the crossing here at the optic chiasm, what you find is that those projections from the left half go together here to be processed on the right side of the brain. So it's not processing information from the left eye, it's processing information from the left half of the visual field from both eyes. Likewise, the information from the right half of the visual field goes through both eyes, but is then processed initially on the left-hand side of the brain, that's the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then they come around and they enter the brain right here at the very, very back in the occipital lobe. It's completely bizarre plumbing. We've mentioned the occipital lobe, so it's time to nail this down. You are not going to do much brain anatomy, but you are required to know a tiny little bit. The outside of the human brain is the cerebral cortex, and it's divided into four lobes which are found on both sides of the brain. So we've got two hemispheres, and each hemisphere has four lobes. The occipital lobe we're talking about is at the very, very back here, it's colored green. When we discuss movement, we were talking about the primary motor cortex here, which is part of the frontal lobe, which is almost the whole of the front half of the brain, colored red here. The temporal lobe is a little lap, which comes around here at the side, just behind the ears. It's colored yellow here. And finally, we've got the parietal lobe, which is up from the occipital lobe, before the frontal lobe, and it's here, just beneath the crown of your head, of your hair. Also shown in this picture is the cerebellum, which is like a little mini brain situated <laughs> underneath all this. That's not part of the cerebral cortex. We met that when we were discussing movement, and we won't worry about it any further today. So, visual activity in the brain, that is brain activity that's associated with the changing pattern of light and dark on the retina, starts here in the occipital lobe. And we can then probe, and we can see for areas that are more remote from this, we can try to see whether what's going on is involved in vision or not. Now we have to be careful here. There are multiple models available to us as we come to understand brains. And most of the work in visual science has been done treating the brain as if it did something which we know it doesn't do. That is, as if it was a serial processor, so we could talk about vision starting here and then look at what happens at the next stage and then what happens at the next stage and then what happens at the next stage. That's an old way of looking at the brain which is not in accord with what we know about connectivity in the brain now. Nevertheless, we can take the recognition that's been of the work done in this mode and we can ask, well, how are parts of the brain that are located further away from primary visual cortex here? What kind of contribution are they making to vision? What kind of information are they involved with? And as we do that, we find that there's two distinct kinds of visual pathway in the brain. Here's the occipital lobe at the back. On the one hand, we, we can follow a pathway up here into the parietal lobe, that's going to be called the dorsal stream. And we can follow a separate, distinct pathway from the primary visual cortex down low here to the bottom of the temporal lobe. That's going to be called the ventral stream. And as we examine the activity of the neurons, the nerve cells, at different stages in these pathways, we find that they're responding to quite different kinds of visual information. As we get further and further away, from the primary visual cortex, we find that the vision that's going on is less clearly related to what's going on in the eyes. 
to the patterns of light and dark on the retina because we find the influence of stuff we already know, concepts we've acquired, high level knowledge and expectation, and also the information from other modalities. So what we see is being informed, we've noted already, by our vestibular system, for example. It's coming in here somewhere. So we're going to look at what's going on in the dorsal stream and what's going on in the ventral stream. And it's kind of weird to treat the brain like this and use those words. Dorsal means the back of. So if you can imagine, instead of a brain, if this was a shark, the dorsal fin would be sticking up here off its back, and the ventral stream here would be its belly. That's a weird way of looking at brains, and anatomists, frankly, are weird people. They look at parts of the body, and they're always having to describe which bit is pointed one way, or which bit is nearer to one bit than another. So I've included your handy guide to such anatomical references here using this dog. And here, dorsal means the back, and ventral means the belly. So imagine the brain in place of the dog there. And there's a load of other ones here, like cranial, caudal, proximal, distal, and so on, that you're free to learn at your leisure if you want. I don't care. The only anatomical distinction we'll be using is this dorsal, ventral one. So we start here with the dorsal stream, projecting from the primary visual cortex up into parietal cortex. It's the red arrows here. And we can give it a simpler name, the where stream, because it's the activity that we see in the brain along these pathways is very much concerned with where you are in space and where other things are in space and whether you're about to walk into something or not. This kind of visual information is very important so you don't walk into walls and so that you dodge something that's thrown at you or that you can catch something that's thrown to you, if you like. It's concerned with your own movement and the movement of things around you because guess what? Your movement and movement of things around you both generate similar patterns of change on the retina. Imagine you're walking towards a wall. Imagine what's happening on your retina there. What's happening is that the elements of texture are expanding, are looming as you get closer to the wall. And you can find exactly the same pattern if you're fixed and the wall is coming towards you, like in the final scene of a Bond movie, for example. If you suffer damage to parts of the brain that lie along this pathway, you're quite liable to have difficulty catching things, pointing to things, and you're quite likely to be impaired in your movement and will walk into things. That role of vision is quite different from the role that we find in the ventral stream, which is with these yellow arrows going down here to inferotemporal cortex. We'll call this the what stream as well as ventral stream. This is concerned with identifying things labeling things, recognizing things, recognizing faces, identifying objects in your surrounding. That turns out to be a very different kind of skill to not walking into walls. Vision is for both. And in fact, if you have impairments down here and you damage this, you might be able to navigate, walk around, catch things just fine, but not be able to name things. That's kind of bizarre, isn't it? How do we know this? Well, since about the 1950s, we've been able, scientists have been able to insert very, very fine electrodes into individual nerve cells. And then what you can do is you can see what do these nerve cells respond to. There are some problems with this approach. It's very difficult. We do it mainly in animals rather than in humans. We do it in humans only prior to surgery, for example. But when we do this, we can find, we can test to see what are individual cells responding to, what makes them fire a lot. Individual neurons may have a low level of activity, but under some conditions, they generate an awful lot of neural impulses or spikes. And this is how we know this. So we look now at some recordings done from this red area here. This is on the inside of the brain. It's at the bottom of the temporal cortex, inferior temporal cortex. This contains cells that respond selectively to particular kinds of things that are meaningful to the subject. Here, for example, are some data recorded from a monkey, from a rhesus macaque monkey. Most mammalian systems, or all mammalian systems, work in more or less the same way. So we can learn a lot from looking at monkeys. And let's look at this plot up here in the left, top left. The middle line here shows the firing 
This is the generation of spikes of an individual cell. And you can see here it's not firing much, here it's not firing much, here it's firing a bit, and here it's going crazy. It's firing like hell, and here it's not firing much at all. The same thing is shown here in these numbers, which simply capture the rate of firing. What we see at the top is the picture that was shown to the rhesus macaque monkey. In this case, they were shown an image of the face of a conspecific, another rhesus macaque monkey, in different orientations. And you can see that this cell is sensitive to an image of a, of a conspecific in profile. That's very, very specific, isn't it? So if this monkey is identifying other things in its environment as a face of another monkey in profile, this cell is probably part of the action. This cell may be involved in all kinds of things, we don't know, and this cell is not seeing anything. Brains don't see, people see. This, this cell, however, is crucially involved in the act of recognizing a conspecific at a particular orientation. You never know in advance what one of these cells is going to respond to. So you, what you do is you put the electrode in and you try lots of different things. Down here on the bottom right-hand side, we can see that here we found the cell and it's responding selectively to a hand like this. That's a starting point. Now what we're going to do is we're going to present a lot of different things and see how does it respond? Well, we turn the hand around, so now it's a hand like this, and it's still responding. You can see the spike here, great deal of activity in this cell. So now we'll make this a cartoon drawing of a hand instead of a real hand, as shown here, and this cell still responds. So this is sensitive to something that's very hand-like, and we can explore that. What happens if we rotate the hand? Now, imagine what's going on in the eye is now completely different, right? Oh, oh, Different parts of the retina are involved, we've rotated it, but this cell doesn't care. This is what I mean as we look deeper and deeper into the brain, we're less concerned with what's going on on the retina and more concerned with knowledge. So here we, this cell is just as sensitive to a hand in this orientation as that orientation. So it's not orientation specific. But look what happens as we vary the size of the image of the hand. When we make it smaller, the response gets smaller until as we make it small enough, the response is extinguished. That's really, really telling. We'll come back to that point in a minute. If we simplify the hands to make it a mitten, like this, with no fingers, the cell is not interested. It doesn't really recognize this as a well, The cell is not recognizing it. See, I've fallen into that bad language already. The cell is not responding when we present an image of a mitten. When we present things that have fingers but are not hands, this cell doesn't respond. When we present a face or a rectangle, this cell doesn't respond. So what have we got here now, looking at these data? We've got a cell that responds selectively to a hand at a fixed distance from the head. What kind of a hand is at a fixed distance from your head? Your own hand. Excellent. You just think about the logic of seeing here. When you're manipulating things here, it's at a distance that's dictated by the length of your arms. So it would make perfect sense, wouldn't it, to be selectively responsive to an image of a hand at a fixed distance, at an appropriate distance for manipulation. This is almost certainly responding selectively to the monkey's own hand. Very good detective work. Now, if we look at neighboring cells in inferior temporal cortex, what we find is they respond similarly. So if the cell next to this might respond there's a good chance it will respond to something like a, a hand-like thing. But we're dealing here with such a complex space that if we look at the organization, it's very difficult to figure out what the, what the basis is, what, thing, what counts as similar and what counts as disparate. So that's shown here with these very complicated objects here. We do find a systematic organization, but the systematicity is difficult to understand. Because as we've moved away from the sensory periphery, the activity that we see in the brain is more intimately connected with knowing. As we go up these various processing pathways, we find cells that respond selectively to more and more abstract properties. Now, I already slipped into the bad language of seeing, saying that the cell was recognizing or the cell was seeing. We shouldn't do that. Cells don't see. Right? If you pursue the logic that we've un uncovered here, though, you could project this to a sort of an absurd endpoint and suggest that, well, we might find a cell in there 
that responds selectively to just the image of your grandmother. We'll call that your grandmother cell. That would be to suggest that a cell is seeing independently of everything else, and that's nonsense. It's not. The cell is one element in a large network of distributed activity distributed across brain, body, and world. But we do find cells that have respond selectively to some very high-level properties, very abstract properties that are very far removed from the low-level play of light on the retina. And in fact, they did once find a human who they were examining prior to surgery, and they found one cell in his inferior temporal cortex that responded selectively to images of Jennifer Aniston. I have no idea why. I'm not even too sure what Jennifer Aniston looks like myself, so it wouldn't work with me. But that, so it's not, you know, things are complicated here, and you can, we can always be surprised. There's a good demonstration of the response of the nervous system to very abstract properties on view in the science block. Many of you will have seen this picture over there of Brian Vonson. He's a lecturer in the physics department, and this picture is hanging up over there, and it is indeed upside down. And I'm sure you know there's something weird about this picture. In fact, the eyes and the mouth have been manipulated so that they're right way up, whereas the rest of the head is upside down. If you could turn this around, though, and just see it the other way up, oh my god, it's grotesque! Kill it! What happened there? Well, normally we encounter faces at a particular orientation, so that your visual system is sensitive not just to the elements, the individual features that make up a face, it's sensitive also to the configuration, the overall holistic configuration, the bit that puts the eyes and the ears and the nose and the mouth all together into an appropriate configuration. But that bit only works apparently for upright faces. It doesn't work for upside down faces. So we can do this kind of bizarre game. Ah, kill it! It's horrible, it's horrible, it's horrible, it's horrible, it's horrible, it's horrible, it's horrible. Ah. And we can sit here all day, and this is going to work every single time for you guys. So you can see it's a really vivid demonstration of the way that there's, vision is more than one thing, and there is a role here for the overall holistic configuration, and it only works for an upright face. Good Lord, that's horrible, isn't it? We'll stop, stop moving there, Brian. Thank you. Now, there was a very important discovery made in a laboratory in Pisa, in Italy, about uh, in the 1990s, sometimes, early 1990s, of a kind of a neuron which has become known as a mirror neuron. They were doing work on rhesus macaque monkeys, which are sort of the workhorse of the cognitive neuroscientists. And these scientists were working with a view of brains and monkeys um, that I personally wouldn't subscribe to. On their view, perception was distinct from action. And they were working with a nerve cell that they had already identified as being part of the motor system of the monkey. It was involved whenever the monkey reached out to pick up a peanut. So when the monkey was involved in this specific kind of goal-directed action. But then one day in the lab, actually the story goes, I don't know, it might be a myth, but there was a postdoc, a researcher in the lab, who reached in and picked up a peanut in front of the monkey, and the recorder happened to be on, and you can hear the clicks, and the clicks went way up, this neuron started responding as if the monkey was doing the action. But the monkey was sitting perfectly still, the monkey was just watching someone else do the action. So to the researchers who were convinced that what they were looking at was part of a motor system, this seemed bizarre. It seemed like this shouldn't be responding to perceptual input, it should be responding to motor output. That's where these neuro neuro neurons got the name mirror neurons, because it seemed that it was almost like an act of self-recognition. The monkey was capable of doing this, but it also responded when someone else did the same thing. Humans are believed to have these neurons as well, and for those who think that they're the best thing since sliced bread, they represent a link between perception and action. But the story I've been telling you I've been careful to couch it so that these two things are inseparable. Remember that box jellyfish larva we saw. If we regard that as a perceptual system, which it seems to be because it's exploiting light information in order to further its own ends of finding food, 
It's indistinguishable from action because we know it's responding to this because it moves the bloody animal towards the food. So perception and action completely indistinguishable there, not separable at all. But the framework that these guys were working in saw perception as separate, and so these mirror neurons were a real puzzle to them. They, on the one hand, seem to respond when the monkey does something, and on the other hand, to respond when the researcher does something. Don't call them monkey see, monkey do neurons. That's a horrible term. And so the relevance or the role that we will accord to these neurons is going to de vary greatly depending on your view of what the nervous system is doing. If you were to see perception as being entirely distinct from action, then mirror neurons look like a huge innovation, something that you wouldn't expect that might be you might build into your explanation of all kinds of things. And researchers working in the field were not slow to jump on this bandwagon. So mirror neurons were put forward as representing a possible link to autism in humans, because it was claimed they, it, there might be an impairment in the system that allows you to recognize the purposes of another person, hence the social deficits in autism. Perhaps they were a basis for empathy, for feeling what other people feel because of this element of self-recognition. Others went really to town and suggested that mirror neurons were a necessary precursor to tool use, from which we get the whole of human culture. Others said, no, 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 I know what these are for. They're for language. This is the mirror neurons are at the basis of human language. Others suggested they were the basis of sports. And you can see what this is doing. I hope you can see what's, what this is doing. It's providing the scientists with a little kind of a blank screen onto which they can project all their hopes and desires and beliefs. That's my account of what mirror neurons are doing. These were discovered in the early 1990s, and a lot of the excessive over-interpretation of this sort has died down a little bit. There was a book published, I think, a year and a half ago by Greg Hickok. It was made it even onto the New York Times bestseller list of non-fiction books. It was called The Myth of Mirror Neurons pointing out the over-willingness of neuroscientists to ascribe a specific role to these interesting nerve cells that are found in the brains of monkeys and probably humans as well. So we're just going to leave the mirror neuron controversy there behind us, but it is clear that interpreting what's going on in the brain is a bit of a black art. It's very, very difficult. And what you see in there is going to be hugely determined by what you think the brain is in the first place. We'll stop there and we'll pick up this story of perception, visual perception, on Thursday.